Okay, <clears throat> so we have now created our setup as you saw from the previous video and then we'll go over those steps real quick. Uh, so we got our part here. Uh, we've got our setup created with the setup button over here. Uh, we have changed from model orientation to selecting a Z uh, plane and an X axis. Uh, the Z plane we use the face right here and for the X axis we use this edge and uh, then we oriented the direction that the part is going to be sitting in the machine so it was correct. Uh, we're going to have the origin on a stock box point uh, which is you're going to measure your tools off of the surface of the stock uh, that you're putting into the machine at the beginning uh, so that the machine knows where the top of your material is so it knows where how far to bring your tool down to cut the top off and to cut the rest of the part uh, as you tell it to. Um, you can have that, you can have um, a selected point which is you can grab any point on your uh, piece and use different geometry to make your point or you can use a model box point where uh, the, the box points that are selectable are directly touching the actual model itself um, so whereas a stock box point gives you these options that are on the stock that you create if you change to model box points those will all snug in and be right on points of the model itself um, that's a different way you can define your stock and your origin location for your uh, cutting paths um, and then the model obviously is the part we're cutting we uh, made it a fixed size box from a relative size box we gave it the uh, parameters of the size of stock we're going to cut up and use to make the part uh, we told it where to put excess stock on the bottom so that we could have more material here than here so that we could chuck this into the vise and then cut off from the top and then uh, we put it on the number one WCS offset uh, which is the location that your uh, machine is going to be aware that your part is in which number one goes to uh, G54 on most machines so that's what we did on the previous video quick synopsis there and then now we're going to go to creating our tool paths to actually cut this part out uh, for this video I am going to um, this is a, cool. uh, for this video I am going to do facing and squaring the block up uh, as this segment so um, we're going to make a tool path. We're going to face off the part um, because that's generally the first thing you do is deck off the surface of the top flat. And uh, so you got several different kinds of tool paths you can select from right here. This is the tool path options. Not this one. Let's simulate. But from here to there is tool paths. Um, you got two dimensional ops, 3D ops, drilling ops, multi axis stuff, turning, and cutting with like laser or water jet type of stuff. Um, for 90% of people who are watching this and who are going to be doing this, you're only going to be using 2D, 3D, and drilling. This stuff, uh, if you don't have a $300,000 machine, you're not going to need any of this stuff pretty much. Um, so, but for doing CNC work, regular 3 plus 2 axis type stuff, uh, <clears throat> you're going to use the 2D, 3D, and drilling operations 100% of the time, basically. Um, and the first one we're going to use is a 2D facing op, which is going to deck off the uh, surface of this. See, we've left uh, 12 and a half thou of material to cut off from the original stock so that we can have a nice flat surface on the top. Uh, you have up here, you have some quick selection options, uh, which is the facing op and 3D adaptive clearing for the 3D ops. Those are buttons you can select. Those don't just indicate that there's other ops down here. But um, these are the 2D ops. They're all right there. We'll go over those in time. And these are the 3D op options uh, that you can select as well. And then drilling pretty much just has drill. And you have different parameters you can adjust in there to make your drilling ops. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is a 2D facing op, which is just going to deck off that surface uh, so that it'll be flush and flat with the top of your part. When you open up to, or sorry, when you select the facing up, you're going to pop up this box over here. We're going to get very familiar with this box 
that has these different tabs to adjust settings. There's a lot of settings, a lot of options. It's cool. They're not that serious. They're not that crazy. I'll get you familiar with the ones that you need to be worried about and the ones that aren't going to affect you too bad. Uh, but you can use all of them to tweak your toolpaths to make them do exactly what you want. Uh, so the first thing we're going to use is, or the first thing you're going to come to is the tool tab. It's where you select the tool you're going to use and uh, give it all the parameters of feed speeds and all that stuff. Pardon me. Okay, so <clears throat> for what we're going to be doing here on this piece of steel, we're going to use a half inch bull nose uh, radius cutter. It's got a 30 thou radius on the end of the tool. And uh, it's a five fluter, I believe. It's a gar tool that we use at work uh, to run these steel parts. Uh, you'll you'll figure out the feeds and speeds you need to use for your uh, parts pieces depending on what kind of material you're cutting, what kind of material the cutters are made of, uh, how big your machine is, how much power it has. All that stuff's going to be taken into consideration here. This is going to be relevant to the machine that I'm using because I'm using this particular machine so I gotta make all my toolpaths to run on this machine but uh, you can look up uh, your manufacturers suggested feeds and speeds uh, there's plenty of different worksheets out there uh, that have all the equations to run whatever speeds and feeds for the material you're using uh, there's a lot of options for figuring out feeds and speeds don't just throw on a feed and speed and hope it works because every type of tool is going to have a different optimal feed and speed rating for the type of tool it is, the size of tool it is, the type of material you're cutting, uh, how big of a cut you're going to take, how deep you're going to take it, how fast it's going to go, all that stuff is going to be different for every single thing that you're going to do. So take the extra few minutes, figure out what's optimal for your machine and for your tool and for your material and use those settings. Um, and I'll just go over quickly the settings that we use for ours um, so that you can get an understanding of how you need to put that together. Uh, what we adjust, generally speaking, is the spindle speed. And that's how fast the uh, the spindle is turning. Uh, we run this at 3,400 RPMs. Uh, the surface speed, you can adjust that if you like, or you can change the cutting feed rate and the surface speed will follow. Uh, you can do those vice versa, and each one will update the other one. Um, so if you run a spindle speed and an optimal surface speed uh, you can define it that way we generally run a spindle speed and a cutting feed rate and let the surface speed match to the, what the cutting feed rate is and we use that per um, what the company recommendation is uh, we just have a book of all the different options for each tool and they have suggestions of feeds and speeds depth of cut width of cut uh, for each different tool okay so we're running this uh, half inch cutter at 3400 RPMs and we generally run it at uh, 25 inches per minute for a facing op taking off about 12 uh, thou thickness of material. And then the uh, feed per tooth will auto populate there as well if you've got your tool defined properly. And then, uh, then you have the lead in feed rate right here and that is your tool is going to come down and it's going to feed into your part slower than the actual full cutting feed rate so that it doesn't slam into the side of your part. So you generally make that a little bit slower than your uh, cutting feed rate. So you're going to come straight down with the tool and it's going to call it, it's going to walk in to the part slowly and then it'll ramp up to the full cutting feed rate. Uh, so we usually do 25 cutting feed rate and uh, 20 inches a minute, 19 inches a minute, whatever, uh, leading in. 25 inches all the way across and then leading out uh, at the tw uh, 19 inches as well. And then the other option you're going to have is the ramp feed rate. Uh, for doing this you're probably not going to need to ramp into the part because you can start outside the part for a facing up generally speaking and run across it. Uh, but a ramping feed rate is sometimes you have to helically ramp a tool down into a part. That feed rate is how fast it's coming down while it's circular interpolating downwards um, so that's going to be really slow because you're cutting on the very bottom of the tool and it's just you need to go really slow to do that um, so 
that one we usually run between two and four inches a minute on the ramp feed rate uh, depending on what the cutter is and if it's pre-drilled and all that kind of stuff uh, so but for facing up you shouldn't need to worry with ramping feed rate we'll get into when you do use it uh, when we get into pockets and that sort of stuff uh, okay and then the plunge feed rate is how fast uh, the machine is going to wrap it downwards towards the part straight down before it starts the walking in feed uh, so the plunge feed rate is only relevant to the the machine rapiding downwards towards the part. It's not actually part of the cutting itself. It's going to stop that plunge before you get to the part and begin your leading in feed rates. Um, but that's how the plunge feed rate works. I use run mine at 12 inches a minute for the plunge just so it doesn't slam down too fast and I can't keep tabs on it. Okay, that is all of the options uh, that we generally fiddle with on the tool tab. Uh, now we're going to move over to the geometry tab. Now for facing up, most of the time you're not going to need to adjust any of this stuff. The, the thing automatically populates to stock contours which is it puts a little yellow box around where the edges of the stock that you defined are and it's going to run around and make sure it cuts off all that stock until it's flat. Sometimes if you got a small, like a you've got a boss that has a flat surface or something like that, um, that you don't need to run across the entire part to face, then you can make a selection for um, the facing operation. But most of the time, you're just decking off the flat surface and you don't need to select anything there. But that is what that does. It drives off of the stock itself, not a part of the model. Um, the tool orientation is something you're going to use if you need to walk down or if you need to have the tool coming in at a different angle because you've got a fourth axis machine or something to that effect 99% of the time you're not going to mess with tool orientation and if you do be careful because it's don't fiddle with that unless you know what you're doing because uh, that's going to make you do uh, make your machine do crazy stuff so just leave the tool orientation box unchecked and let it ride until you get to more advanced type of stuff okay now this is always a complicated confusing tab for most people. The heights tab is going to tell you a bunch of different kinds of heights and they're going to be color coded and you're going to have a preview of each one on uh, your model when you're looking at this tab and it's very hard to tell which one's which and wh what height they're at because when you flip it up to where you can see them you can't see exactly how high each one is really well anymore and then they tell you what the names are but they don't know what they're referencing and then you turn back this way and now you can't read them anymore so I wonder if maybe it would be good for them to flip as you rotate the piece maybe flip these definitions down to where you can read them from the side maybe that would be a good idea maybe I'll talk to them about that anyways that's neither here nor there um, the different kinds of heights all reference different things the machine is going to do uh, with the height of your tool path. Um, your clearance height is going to be just nothing is happening at this height. This is like your your home base height where everything is away you're safe from hitting any parts everything is cool. Oh and if you hover over these and leave your mouse still there you go. The clearance height is the first height the tool wraps to on its way to start the tool path. So it comes down to the clearance height boom and stops. Cool. Alright, now what you're going to see here, the black highlighted piece is the height you're referring to. The height that it's going to reference off of is the one in the drop down box. That gets kind of sketchy with people. So your clearance height offset is defined at 0.4. And most, a lot of times people will think their clearance height is then the surface of the part and 400 thou above. But no, it's what it's saying here is it's referencing referencing the clearance height from the retract height to make sure that the clearance is always above the retract because the clearance is supposed to be the highest option. So that's actually four hundred thousandths above the retract height. So the clearance height is the retract height plus four hundred thousandths. I know that's kind of complicated, but understanding how that each piece references the other one is going to make the heights tab seem a lot less confusing because you can have a bunch of weird um, errors that come up 
if you don't properly define your heights. So the clearance is referencing the height of your retract and then it's going up 400 thousandths. Now your retract height is referencing the top of your stock, which again is not the top of your part because you define your stock with 12 and a half thou above the model itself. So the stock top is actually uh, not visible right here in this set of heights, but you know that it's referencing off of the stock top, and you know the stock top is 12 and a half thou above your actual part, and then it's offset from there by 200 thousandths. I know that's a lot to take in. Basically, what you need to know is the retract height is referencing from the stock, it's going up 200 thousandths, and the retract height is. Oh, it's not going to leave me. Hold on. Oh, it's not going to be cool like that. There you go. So the retract height sets the height that the tool moves up to before cutting the next cutting pass. Retract height should be set above the feed height and above the top. Retract height is used together with the subsequent uh, offset to establish height. Anyways, that's what we just said. But the point is, the retract height is when your cutter is cutting, it's going to come off at some point and have to go somewhere else. When it comes off and has to go wrap it to a different place, it's going to retract upwards and then move to that place and then come back down and feed back into your part. So that's what that's where the retract word comes in and makes sense. You're cutting, 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 cutting. You got to move somewhere else and not hit any of your clamps or anything like that. It's going to retract upwards and move to where you need to go and then come back down and walk back in. So that's what your retract height is doing and then uh, it's referencing off the stock and up by 200 thou. Your feed height is going to be where your cutter actually starts to feed into the material. Um, so it's going to come down to a certain height and then it's going to start to feed slowly into your part and that's what the uh, the lead-ins and lead-outs were referencing was the feeding in. Uh, that's sorry. The feed height is the height at which you're going to start that lead-in feeding rate. And then uh, that's going to be referencing off of the top height, um, which is where you're going to actually start cutting material. And then the top height and 200 thou above that is where your feed height is going to reference from. So with here, your top height is the highest point of your stock that you're going to start to cut. And from here, we're referencing the top of the stock itself with zero offset. So we're going to actually start cutting material at the top of the stock with no offset at all. And then the bottom height is the lowest point your tool is going to come to to do whatever work you're doing. And that's going to be, these are all going to be consistent throughout every different kind of uh, tool path. So I know this is kind of long winded, but it's going to be the same sets of references from now on for every kind of tool path you work with. So, sorry it's long and slow, but bear with me. Um, the bottom height is gonna be the lowest point your tool comes to, and for this, we're using a facing operation. The bottom height, we're just gonna run right to the top of the model itself, which should be dead on, even with the top of your part. Um, so, again, uh, the model top with no offset. And the top height is referencing off the stock top, the beginning height of your cut, and the feed height is going to ramp down slowly until you get to that stock top. And that's when it's going to start to actually run uh, the, the cutting feed rates. So that is a brief and convoluted uh, explanation of the heights tab. So big takeaways there. This is the height you're looking at. The height in the drop down box is what you're referencing off of. And the offset is how far above what you just said you're going to reference. That's all you really need to know about the clearance height and the rest of it will kind of fall into place and make sense as you start to build tool paths. All right, heights tab, done. <laughs> the next thing you're going to deal with is the uh, passes tab. The passes tab uh, tells you what kind of step overs, how far you're going to step over, how far down each cut's going to go, if you need to make multiple depths of a cut, 
all that sort of stuff is going to be in your passes tab. That's the actual cutting toolpath pass. Um, so the first thing you're going to deal with is the facing up and the pass direction tolerance is going to pretty much auto populate to four tenths. Leave it there, it's fine. Uh, pass direction uh, is zero degrees. You're only going to need to do pass direction if for some reason you need to cut diagonally across here or something weird like that. 100% of the time, you're not going to mess with pass direction on facing up. You'll use pass direction on a 3D parallel, and that's pretty much the only time you're going to use it. Most of the time. Uh, but that is an option. You can run the tool crooked. You can run it back and forth. You can run it side to side. Uh, and you can use the pass direction uh, to choose that. Most of the time, you're not going to use it. Um, pass extension for a facing operation is going to take where you're cutting and it's going to extend that off the part so if you're going to want to cut and have a nice smooth entrance and then cut all the way across the part and then let the tool go beyond the part before it starts to raise up so that you don't get any any kind of chattering or any kind of weird looks in your part you don't want your tool to come up too soon uh, you're going to put the pass extension on there and it's going to extend the end of your cutting path beyond the part by the amount that you put in right there. Um, you won't use that one very much, but oftentimes you will use the stock offset for a facing operation because the stock offset actually adds direction in all four directions to the top of your, uh, uh, to the to the shape of your toolpath. So basically a regular cutting toolpath for a facing op is gonna go right on the edges of your stock, across, 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 and right on the back edge of your stock and it it can be sketchy if you haven't perfectly defined your stock to match what your actual piece is going to look like uh, and your cutter might be really close to the margins there if you use the stock offset tab and add 150,000, 200,000, something like that it makes the literal size of the stock extended on all sides by that amount so it makes the cutter be running where the center of the cutter is going across that edge instead of just barely hugging that edge where you might have some sticking up afterwards um, so the stock offset is a very good option uh, sometimes if you have just some unusual parameters with your cut and you need to extend that size um, of your tool path for your facing up <clears throat> most of the time you won't need to use any of those three but those are what they do um, the biggest thing you're going to fiddle with if you need to is the step over. We're using a half inch cutter. It's stepping over 418 thou, and that's most of the diameter of the cutter. Um, and so you're going to get the most flat surface next to one another. If you make the step over really small, you're probably going to end up with a bunch of little stripes in your uh, in the face of your part, and it's not going to be super duper smooth. That's why you cut a very small amount of thickness for your facing up and then you run really thick cuts across it and it gives you the smoothest, flattest surface possible. Um, direction, you can run both ways where uh, the cutter will kind of go in a loop side to side on the part um, or you can change it to climb or conventional. We use climb because we've got big strong machines uh, and it will cut across. It'll come up off the part, come back, drop down again, cut across the same way. That way you'll get the most consistent um, surface finish when you're finished because uh, if you cut one way and then you let it go the opposite direction as well on top of the material you're going to have the opposite rotational scuffing on the surface of your part from your cutter uh, so picking one direction and running that direction is going to give you the best possible surface finish um, so those are the usual things you're going to mess with um, you'll usually not need to use chip thinning or cut from the other side don't worry with that too much uh, the only other options are stock to leave and multiple depths these are going to be relevant to very many different kinds of tool paths um, so keep tabs on these uh, they're not always on you gotta select them to turn them on now what this is going to do is let you run multiple different heights of a cut um, in case you've got some large amount of material up here on the top and you can't run it all in one pass um, the multiple depths is going to let you run drop down a certain amount cut across come back drop down further 
cut across, come back, drop down further. As many times as you need to, you tell it how big the step down is, and then you can make it a finishing bottom step down so you get one really thin cut at the bottom if you need to. And then uh, using even step downs, it'll adjust this from relative of your stock to your part. It'll divide it by however many pieces you tell it to, and then it'll run that away, and you'll get even cuts all the way down. Uh, you're not going to use that much for a facing out because you're going to purposefully only leave a small, tiny amount on the top to cut away. Um, but that's what multiple depths does. The only other thing is stop to leave. And that is going to be if you want to have that facing up run but not come all the way completely down on the surface of the part because maybe you've got some three dimensional stuff you got to fiddle with or something like that later. Stop to leave is. Um, how deep the cutter goes relative to the surface of the actual model. So stock to leave for a facing up you'll not use very much because generally speaking you're facing the part off from rough stock and there's nothing to measure a perfect identical uh, top surface off of. You're going to reference everything else off of the surface that you cut. So most of the time for a facing up you don't need stock to leave but it is an option uh, for other other things. and. So at some point, I'll go over a reason where you would use stock to leave on a facing up, but no worries for that for now. All right, so that's the passes tab. And then the last one we'll go over is the linking tab. Now, the linking tab can get dicey. There's a lot of different options. They mean a lot of different things, and uh, there's different linking uh, options on each different kind of toolpath as well. Uh, so for this one, uh, this one has kind of the least linking options. And for the most part, on facing ops, you're not going to really need to adjust pretty much anything in the linking tab uh, most of the time. So you're going to have it, it's going to start off in preserve uh, rapid feed rate mode, and you can adjust that to a couple different things. You'll pretty much just leave it in that mode, unless you've got something very specific you're working with. But 99% of the time, you leave that alone. Uh, allowing rapid retract just is allowing it to come up off the part real quick to come back if you're running one directional passes uh, then you'll have the keep tool down uh, because you don't want the tool to be lifting up and if the tool comes up you know you lose your pretty surface finish so the keep tool down um, uses the algorithm to try and keep the tool touching the part as long as possible and then uh, maximum stay down distance uh, tells you how long the thing is going to try to keep using algorithms to figure out how to keep that tool down the maximum amount possible and so right here it's running two and a half inches of doing maximum algorithms to keep that tool touching the surface of the part um, and extend report extend before retract is another thing where you're gonna make sure that tool walks all the way off the part before it comes up and moves to the next uh, part of the tool path and then uh, that's all those and then you have lead-ins and transitions um, which is where your tool is going to come down from the sky here and then it's going to curve and walk in and walk across you can have that on you can turn it off the tool comes straight down it'll walk straight across depends on what you're cutting what you need it for sometimes you need a tool path where it comes down and walks into the part sometimes you need to drop straight down and cut straight across this uses that lead um, uses that uh, slower feed rate uh, that we talked about in the tool setting which is the lead in and lead out feed rate that's where it's going to be coming into play you're wrapping down then you're leading in with that radius and walking it in and then you're going to go across and it's going to lead out slower and curve up like that um, so that's the lead in lead out uh, and you can turn that on and off right there and then a vertical lead in radius is if it's going to lead in you're going to let it come in on a radius and come down like an arc and that gives you the radius of the arc that it's going to be turning on to come down um, you have you can have it where it only walks in that way but then comes straight off the part you can have it lead out with the same radius you can have a match you can turn off same as lead in and then you can make a different radius for it to come out on than what it came in on most of the time you don't need to fiddle with it most of the time with a facing up you pretty much just select the tool and hit OK. But since it's the first tool path we're doing, those are the different things you need to look at. Uh, those are the different tabs you're going to work with. 
and that's most of the parameters you're going to have to fiddle with while you're making toolpaths so it was good to get all those things uh, worked out individually and then later on when we go to do different kinds of toolpaths we can kind of quickly run over those without having to do a full rundown of each one individually so we did that on this video ta-da <laughs> okay then you hit OK you wait for it to build your toolpath you take a nap while it's building your toolpath and there it is okay so here we'll show you exactly what we were talking about before sorry my computer is slow as Christmas um, sorry I didn't tell you what was going on there um, when you s this is the toolpath you just created the, the setup is what we made the to this is the first toolpath we made uh, this is the facing up you're gonna take off the surface you know what we're talking about um, then you can come up here to the simulate button and it'll show you the toolpath you made when you get this going change this from all toolpath to tail change the holder to transparent so you can see through the tool and make sure nothing's going crazy you're not running into any parts turn your stock on and I usually change it to transparent so I can see the part versus the stock that's just the options that I like to use with it so I can see what all's going on and that's the way to make it uh, easy to see what you got info tab is going to be the position that your tool is actually in in real time and space and then you get a couple more uh, little things to check out in here and then statistics is going to tell you how long the uh, how long the machining time is actually going to last and then how far you actually machined and uh, the operations and tool changes that you had uh, those are the simulation options you're going to use that a lot um, so you're going to let it go ahead and show you with the simulation what you've designed Boom. Boom. Okay, so that's the toolpath we made. It's running right across the surface of the part here. Let's uh, orient this way. The blue line is the toolpath itself. And then you see that's the stock we cut off in the lighter green. And the darker green is the actual part. You see at the surface, they perfectly match, which means you cut your material all the way down with your facing op to match perfectly on with your part. So this is the first part, or the first uh, piece of the surface of your actual part that you've now revealed um, so that right there is the actual surface the final part and then what you can do is when you have your simulation running you can pause it you can move around you can look at where the tool is what it's doing uh, I'm gonna show you right here okay so that's what you're cutting is this amount right here and then this is how far your tool is off of the part and now imagine this is a half inch of space so you've only got a hundred thou, hundred fifty thou maybe of this tool off the side of the part and if you haven't defined your stock perfectly well um, you might run the risk of having that tool not um, make it to the edge of your stock which is where oh this is the big okay look how little it's a 30 thousandths radius right here that's the only thing that is actually making it all the way to the end of your stock right here that's why I was saying you could end up with a toolpath where the tool doesn't cut all of the stock away so you see that's where we're ending up with the way we've defined everything if you come up with that issue that's when you're gonna go back and adjust go to your passes tab your stock offset you can add an eighth of an inch maybe 125 thou to your stock offset now it's gonna run that cutter an eighth of an inch further out this way and an eighth of an eighth of an inch further out that way now when you run your simulation your first tool path is gonna have that cutter half and half on so you're only cutting half as much with the first tool path but you're not gonna end up at the end with that little 30 thou radius being the only part of your uh, cutter that's going to be touching the stock which might result you with a not flat part to go and try and do the rest of your uh, different kinds of operations you chuck that into the bottom of your uh, chuck that into your vise and then you're not going to have a flat surface so your other side is not going to match up properly to your first side 
boom that's what we want to look at so now on your final pass you've got definitely flat surface of that cutter cutting material that will save you some heartache at some point I promise okay so that's our facing operation see these little radiuses right here this is your cutting this is your lead out and this is your extending up to your retract height again so when you're looking at your simulations the blue is cutting the green is going to be linking moves which is generally going to be leading in or leading out a yellow move is going to be retracting upwards uh, back to the retract height and then that's a 55 second operation and now you've got your first toolpath made as you're walking in there's your feeding and that radius uh, lead in move cutting feed rate lead out up and out of the way out of the way uh, your red arrow is going to show you where the tool is going in your green arrow is going to show you where the tool is coming out that's going to be really useful later on when you get to parallel cuts and that sort of thing where it's going to it's a bunch of cuts straight across but you got to figure out which if the toolpath is running downwards or upwards or left to right and that kind of thing these arrows will really help you with that to figure out what your uh, what your toolpath is doing and how you need to adjust it uh, we are going to call it right there and make that today's video uh, so I know that was kinda long but it's a, a good necessary evil uh, to figure out how all the rest of the toolpaths are gonna run so sorry to be long-winded but that is how you make any operation is going to run on those different sets of parameters. Now you've got an operation that will run that can be legitimate and work in a real life scenario. Thank you guys for watching. Um, I'll try and get uh, some of these videos out every couple of days and work with each different kind of toolpath. And uh, now that we've done this long spiel, uh, we'll be able to go through and do a little bit more uh, just kind of quick fire uh, how each operation is going to be built later on so thank you for watching uh, much appreciated uh, if you want to uh, see some more of these kinds of videos from me you can subscribe to my youtube channel which is just my name david troutman and uh, if you would like uh, to support uh, my content directly i would much much appreciate it uh, you can do that at my patreon uh, which is at patreon.com slash d trout m zero uh, which is the same as my instagram and you can follow me there uh, at instagram and it is d trout m zero there as well okie doke thank you so much guys we will do this again sometime soon have a great afternoon <laughs>